Hello, romance and fantasy fans, and welcome to episode two of Roma Corden's Bewitching a Highlander. I'm Kayla, and this is Camcat Unwrapped. Previously on Bewitching a Highlander, Brina creates a false identity to get close to Laird Campbell, a powerful man who she believes is responsible for her father's captivity and possibly her mother's death. He wouldn't hesitate to order her imprisonment, or worse, her immediate execution, if he found out Brina is a witch. Nonetheless, Brina is willing to put herself at risk if it means finding answers and her father. Hopefully, no one will spill her secret. Chapter 7 Brina sat her uncle down in the chamber across the hall from hers to tend to his cut lip. He'd returned with Alban and their trunks after leaving their wagon with George, who had decided to camp outside with the Dunbar retainers. Healing was more than Brina's livelihood. It gave purpose to her life, not to mention the gratification of healing the sick and injured. She'd be at a loss if it were taken from her. If Egan found out about her witchery and her family's history, it could threaten all she held dear. She couldn't let that happen. She wouldn't. Then there was her dream of having a family of her own, a husband and bairns who belonged to her, the same as she belonged to them. A dream she'd had since her parents had vanished. It had filled the void and given her hope for her future. If her witchery was revealed to the McIntyres, she'd be shunned. No one would take her to wife then. Something sharp gnawed at her insides, as if her future tilted precariously on the proverbial edge of a cliff. She pushed the thought aside as she tilted Craig's chin up to apply the alcohol. Craig eyed her. If fast enough, lass, it doesn't even hurt. Besides, I can do that myself. If I left it up to you, you'd let it fester. You are a grand healer for others, just not for yourself. She ignored a dismissive wave of his hand and sprinkled some alcohol onto a piece of linen. With care, she patted the damp linen on the cut. Ouch! I thought it didn't hurt. He huffed. She was well acquainted with the male tendency to act tough. It was a tendency she ignored. Brina finished cleaning the wound and reached for the St. John's wart salve. Not wanting Keith or Alban to overhear her next words, she strode to the door and closed it before returning to Craig's side. As she applied the salve, his eyes flipped up at her. What is it? Since the Dunbars are all taken up at present, and Egan is otherwise occupied, we should have a look around the grounds, she whispered. And what about our guards outside? She ruminated for a second. We could make a pretense of looking for the bathhouse. Now's as good a time as any, I suppose. Something in his tone made her pause. I am obliged you consented to us coming here, despite the dangers. I hope it's a decision I don't regret, for both our sakes. A short while later, Brina strode into the courtyard beside Craig, she fetched linen and a heather-pressed soap in the event they were interrogated. Alban and Keith were close behind. The waxing moon shed meagre light on their surroundings despite it having swelled since she'd last seen it a few days ago, much like her hope of finding her father. And while there was a chill in the air, it wasn't the kind that seeped into your bones, like in the Campbell's solar. Brina and Craig assessed their surroundings, then Brina's posture perked up at the burning torch by the side of the building across from where they stood. The most she'd garnered about dungeons was that they tended to be close to the guardhouse, and if she was not mistaken, the burning torch signalled guards on duty. Brina flicked a purposeful glance at Craig and inclined her chin in the direction of the guardhouse. 
Craig gave a discreet nod. Brina cleared her throat. I'd wager that's the bathhouse. That's not the bathhouse, it's the guard, said Alban. Yes, it looks like the bathhouse. If not, I am sure they can point us in the right direction, Craig said, his words unnecessarily loud. She was beholden to Craig for interrupting Alban, who no doubt wanted to set them straight. Brina ignored Alban's puzzled expression and darted for the entrance to the guardhouse, forcing everyone else to keep up. The guardhouse was an improvement, for unlike inside the keep, out here she could identify the stench, a particularly ripe version of horse manure, sweat and the outhouse. Archaic and unpolished broadswords, maces and axes hung on the walls. The walls themselves looked like they hadn't been whitewashed in years. Two Campbell guards were seated at a table across from each other in the midst of a card game. Their heads jerked up at Brina as she entered. From their bulging eyes and gaping mouths, Brina ventured to guess that women did not frequent the guardhouse. After a moment's awkward silence, both guards jumped to attention. Their stools fell over with simultaneous thuds. One of the guards was tall and lanky like a beanpole with a flat gaze. The other guard, who was short and beefy, had a shrewd look about him. Brina scanned the guardhouse and spotted an arched doorway toward the back, blocked by a barred iron door, which seemed a promising start. She threw on a toothy smile at the shrewd guard in an attempt to flirt, hoping her inexperience didn't show. She sauntered toward him, just as Craig, Alban and Keith arrived. Good evening, kind sirs, Brina said. M Mistress, how can we be of service, the shrewd guard said. His blinking eyes signalled uncertainty, which she pounced on by gently brushing invisible dust from his right arm. We arrived today from Kilmuir. Can you believe it took three days to get here? The guards exchanged a look of uncertainty, at the same time that Brina shot Craig a calculated glance while inclining her chin in the direction of the barred iron door. Brina snapped her head back with a feigned smile to the guards, concentrating on the shrewd one. She reached out as if to touch his arm again, but then paused mid-reach, lowered her chin, and brushed some imaginary dust from her décolletage as she thrusted out her chest. It was wicked of her, but it was all for a good cause. She was taken aback when it worked. She regaled the guards with step-by-step -step details of their journey. Giggling and twirling her braid did wonders for the animation of her story. Out of the corners of her eyes, she kept track of Craig as he pressed on to the back and examined the doorway. When he started back toward her, she wrapped up her story. Brina blinked bit on her lip and looked around as if taking note of her surroundings for the first time. Why, this isn't the bathhouse. Can you good gentlemen direct us to the bathhouse? We are quite lost. It's in the keep, behind the kitchen, mistress. Separate ones for the laddies and the lassies, the taller guard said, showing yellow teeth. I am indebted to you. I bid you good night. Later, after her bath, Brina scuttered up the stairs toward her bedchamber, grinning as she recalled the guard's astonishment at her appearance in the guardhouse. Brina wasn't a feckless woman, but she'd enjoyed acting as one today. It was a strategy she'd used on occasion to get her male patients to drink their tinctures or promise to stay off an injured leg or broken arm. She was now keen to speak with her uncle about what he'd found. She tilted her head up as she reached the top of the stairs. A falcon's wings expanded in her chest. Egan stood on the landing. Next to him was a monolith of a highlander she'd observed him speaking with earlier. His eyes narrowed, which made her clutch her linen and soap tighter. There's aught amiss, Egan said. Pardon me? Had Alban or Keith said something to Egan? The Campbell's head of household sent up food with a chambermaid, but the maid couldn't locate either you or Craig, and as it happens, I am unable to locate both Alban and Keith. 
Katrina exhaled in a rush of air. So he didn't know about her visit to the guardhouse. I left them at the bathhouse. It slipped my mind to inform Keith or Alban I was finished. Forgive me if I caused any worry. I need to speak with both you and your father. She blinked. What could he possibly want to speak to them about? Craig, m my father is in the men's bathhouse. As he is unavailable, do me the honour of taking a turn with me outside. His words would have been gracious if he had chosen to return her attempt at a smile. Chapter 8 Egan's suspicions refused to be crushed by the quiet calm of the night. In fact, after Gregor from the Dunbar camp informed him of what Craig's coachman had said, he felt vindicated from his earlier hunches. As the story goes, Craig's coachman, George, guilelessly let it slip that Craig and Brina were here to rescue someone. The subtle floral notes of earthy heather imbued with something exotic flirted with Egan's nostrils, sidetracking his purpose. It conjured up the deep pink and purple glens behind Alienach in the springtime, fragrant and stunning, some with sinuous winding lochs, lakes, and others with freshwater creeks. It was all wild and untamed, and so unlike this place. He'd swived his first lass in one of those glens almost fifteen years ago, Lucy with the bright green eyes. Turned out, Lucy did quite a bit of swiving, and not just with him. He eyed Brina now before he asked his question, curious about her reaction. Were you and Craig in the guardhouse tonight? She kept her head straight, but the fingers of her right hand popped up to tap her parted lips. Although nothing changed in her overall countenance, he detected a stiffening of her shoulders. Gregor had also reported seeing them leaving the guardhouse. We mistook it for the bathhouse, Brina said. No one in their right mind would make that mistake. Her guard was up. A subject occurred to him that might bring it down. He shot her a glimpse and offered a smile. How long have you been a healer? The rigidity in her shoulders eased. I started practicing seven years ago, although I apprenticed for Craig in the beginning. Egan noted with no little interest that she referred to her father by his first name, if he was indeed her father. He took a step back. You started practising when you were what? Ten? She shot him a dubious glance. Is that question designed to flatter me? He feigned a look of shock. Why ever would you say that? The curve of her jaw relaxed a little bit more, but it wasn't quite a smile. Meaningless endeavour your attempt at flattery. I am no young miss. You're not exactly an old spinster either. She continued as if he hadn't spoken. I started observing Grandmother Sorsha, who was also a healer, when I was six, but my formal training didn't start until I was older. Six? Didn't she take time to enjoy childhood? Come to think on it, training on his own responsibilities as future Laird had started at an early age as well. In addition to arithmetic, Gaelic, philosophy and the arts, his tutor had taught him the subtleties of addressing peerage for those rare social occasions when he had to converse with his grandfather. The duties of their squires, marshals, seneschals, retainers, pastoralists and the lot had been drilled into him at a young age. As a boy, Egan hadn't understood why he'd had to learn more, practice harder, be smarter, tougher and faster than the other lads. It had taken him some time to work it all out. He too hadn't had a typical childhood. Have you always wanted to be a healer? She nodded as she bent down to pluck a piece of tall meadow grass. And you're quite accomplished from what I've seen. I suppose, she mumbled absently, twirling the grass around her pointing finger. And modest as well. This time a genuine smile broke out. He'd achieved his purpose. He scrutinised her as he asked his next question. 
I was surprised to find you here on call. I'd have thought as the McIntyre's healer, you'd be quite busy at Duntulm. Her eyelids fluttered as her mouth opened to speak, but no words came out. His eyes lingered on her lips, taking in their heart shape for a bit too long before he blinked away. My unc- father and I told you why we were here, to unload merchandise and see an old friend. Egan had negotiated enough clan disputes for the Dunbars to know when someone was lying. Something clicked in his gut, and he took a chance. Are you here to find your uncle? No, we're here to find a friend. The pitch of her voice had risen, conspicuously so. I misunderstood. Forgive me. What's your friend's name? The delicate muscles at her throat worked as if she was having trouble swallowing. Why was she hesitant to discuss this friend? A look of resignation edged its way across her soft feminine features. His name is Ian. Egan sensed that was the truth. He chuckled. Is this Ian infamous? He'd meant it as a jest, but her widening eyes suggested she not only found no humour in his question, but that he'd hit some thread of truth. It was clear she was poor at dissembling, particularly when nonplussed. No. Egan made a mental note. He needed to work more on his wit and charm. A thin layer of sweat had formed on her forehead despite the coolness of the night. The name McCrae, which Dagan had used several months ago, bounced back into his head. Is he a McCrae? Yes, no, why all these questions? The bluster in her tone shot up. The wideness of her eyes reminded him of a scared little bird. Egan tried not to be too pleased with himself. It was distinctly possible she and Craig were looking for someone named Ian McRae, if he believed her slip of the tongue more than her actual answer. He was inclined to in this instance. A distant look washed over her face, wiping away the scared little bird. Something akin to fear settled there, that quickened into straight-out panic. Was the lass in trouble? Her expression elicited something foreign in Egan. It grabbed hold of his gut and twisted. It was difficult to identify what it was. Protectiveness? The unexpected rawness of it hit him, shattering his senses. When Egan was seventeen, his grandfather, Sir Donald Lindsay, baronet, had called his own daughter, Egan's mother, common. The insult had riled Egan, and his protectiveness had caused him to lash out at his own grandfather. They'd never exchanged more than two words again. Was that protectiveness resurfacing now? It was difficult to reconcile himself to it, considering he knew so little about Brina. Let me help you, he said, before he could stop himself or consider the ramifications of what he was offering. He'd stopped walking and was facing her. Brina stared at him wide-eyed and shook her head. She let out a laugh, but he doubted she meant for it to sound strangled. It's unnecessary, I assure you. I thank you for that and for your concern, but it has been a long day and I need rest. I bid you good night. Her abrupt words held gratitude, but her tone lacked any. She whirled around and raced back to the keep. Her thick hair, the colour of a raven's wings and still damp from her recent bath, glistened in the night and cascaded down her back like luminescent waves of silk, ending just above the gentle curve of her pert bottom. The shade of her burgundy overdress, the colour of a French Bordeaux, was a stark contrast to the eggshell white of her underskirt peeking out at the hem. The material swayed like a siren's call as she darted into the Campbell's keep. Egan stared at the spot where she'd disappeared. Well, he'd just done a fine job of it. At least she hadn't told him to go to hell. Chapter 9 A short while later, 
Egan strode into his bedchamber, but then stopped abruptly. A full-figured chambermaid was turning down his bed. She threw him a bold come-hither glance. However, her plump lips and generous cleavage left his nethers cold. May I be of any service, sir? Any service at all? Her tone husky and honeyed. Egan skimmed past her voluptuous bosom and rounded bottom straight into the plain chamber with its unlit brazier, tattered writing desk and mismatched chair. Can you light that, he said, nodding in the direction of the brazier. Her lips thinned into disappointment. Egan sauntered toward the desk, giving her a wide berth. He leaned over to the smudged window pane and threw it open. He had to clear the cobwebs in his head. He shifted around to scan the room as the maid busied herself with the brazier. The hideous counterpane atop the uneven mattress eyed him. Egan feared the frail wooden frame would collapse with even the lightest weight. A few days ago, he would have taken immense pleasure in breaking the damn thing as he took the chambermaid up on her offer. But for some reason, that held no appeal tonight. The next morning, a cockerel somewhere crowed out for dawn, two hours before the sun ignited the horizon with its customary fiery hues. Upon concluding his ablutions with the cold, meagre water in the ewer by his bedside, Egan stepped out of his bedchamber. He surveyed the hall. Where was Alban? The lad almost always awaited instructions on the day's tasks right outside his chamber. Alban's pleasant demeanour, unassuming ways and eagerness made him perfect for a clandestine mission Egan needed accomplished. Have you seen Alban? Egan said as he strode past Rory. Rory was one of his youngest retainers, who'd taken guard duty the previous night. He was the size of an elk, large enough to lug the various weapons he had strapped to his body with space to spare. He came by earlier, sir. He headed in the direction of the guardhouse. Egan trotted down the stairs, strutted into the courtyard and headed for the guardhouse. He welcomed the cool dewiness of the pre-dawn air against his face, except for the calls of the black and white gannets and the sharp whistles of the white-bellied guillemots nestled in the trees, nothing stirred. It appeared the Campbells were late risers. He stepped into the guardhouse with the aim of asking after Alban, but stopped precipitously and froze. Alban, Craig, and two of the Campbell guards were in the middle of a card game at a wooden trestle table. From the empty trenchers and goblets around them, They'd broken their fast already, but that was not what made him stop all of a sudden. The last person he'd expected to see in the guardhouse was Brina. Egan's eyes swept the full length of her. She stood dressed in the same gown as the previous night, except this time her glossy hair was dry, plaited, and the ends held together with a wide red ribbon. In the blackness of the previous night, He'd failed to catch the way the burgundy dress emphasised the rose hue of her cheeks or the paleness of her décolletage, now revealed under a flickering torch. Rena pointed at a card in one of the guard's hands. But how can an ace be both a one and an eleven? Rena asked, her lips pinched together. Something in her posture looked practised, as if she were a thespian on stage. As Van Turn card rules, mistress, one of the guards said, then gave the widest and longest open mouth yawn Egan had ever seen. Egan cleared his throat with drawn out exaggeration. Five heads swivelled around to face him. The two guards nodded in his direction, their movements slow, their eyes heavy. Had they been up all night, or was drunkenness involved? If he lived in a dung pile of a castle like this, he'd drink before dawn too. Alban stood up, staggering in the process. Egan lifted an eyebrow. Good morning, sir. How may I be of service? Alban said, his words slurred. Egan narrowed his eyes. Alban, too. Come find me when the game is over. Alban plopped himself back on his stool. 
had just one night at the Campbell's Keep driven Alban to drink and gamble. In contrast to the others, Craig and Brina looked quite alert and attentive. Egan didn't miss the way Brina avoided his gaze. The panic that had been imprinted on her features from the previous night was now replaced with determination. Craig, on the other hand, had blanched when his eyes had connected with Egan's. He now seemed intent on studying the cards in his right hand, which he had lifted like a shield in front of his face. One of the guards, whose head bobbed far too much, landed head down with a loud clunk on the table. Egan gaped, but no one else seemed to notice. When loud, throaty snores, which threatened to bring down the roof, started to vibrate from the felled guard's mouth, then it hit Egan. Had he thought her a Valkyrie the previous day? No, she was more like Loki, a trickster. Egan's heart rate quickened as adrenaline pulsed through his veins. Brina, may I have a word outside? I am busy at the moment, perhaps later. Her chin inched outward with obstinacy. Egan shot her a steely gaze. I insist we speak now. He'd opted for a chastising tone, the same one he had used in the past with his sister Phoebe and little brother Alex whenever he'd wanted to impress upon them the error of their mischievous ways. Of course, it never worked with them. His eyebrows shot up when Brina stepped around the table and sauntered toward him. Craig threw them both a questioning glance as Egan ushered her outside. The dullness of the pre-dawn sky cloaked them in shadows. He stayed close to the wall of the guardhouse. He didn't want anyone who came out of the keep witnessing them. If his suspicions were correct, they'd need the stealth. When they were out of eyeshot and earshot of the guards, he swung around to face her. He glared as she scuttered to catch up, stopping two paces away. Her movements brought her face into full illumination by the torch's light. He took in the pursed lips and the deep crease between her brows. Her attempt to appear disinterested in his interest was having the opposite effect. It's no coincidence you're both at the guardhouse again, is it? His whisper was sharp. He hoped no one overheard. Pardon me, Master Dunbar? He didn't believe the blank look she threw him. I've given you leave to use my name. It's Egan, and diffidence will not serve you well in this conversation. Forgive me, Egan. I don't follow. The determination in her chin turned to full-blown sassiness with a hip jut to the left. For a moment, Egan was speechless at her reaction. His eyes lingered a bit too long on the apricot glow of her lips under the torch's light. He swallowed back the flood of moisture to his mouth. I'm returning to the game, she said with an impatient huff and turned around. Egan reached out and swung her back around. The buzz of a shock sizzled through his body at contact with her arm. Egan jerked back and released her. Her eyes widened, surprised as well. Egan exhaled in a rush, hoping to rid himself of the heat building up inside him. If the Campbells find out what you and Craig are up to, and you're lucky, you'll find Ian for sure, because you'll both be joining him in the dungeon. And if unlucky, neither of you will leave Karoch alive. Her eyebrows shot up, and her jaw ground down in what looked like obstinacy. She lowered her eyes, examined her shoes, and flattened the front of her skirts. When she faced him once more, the determination was back. Master Dunbar, whatever are you referring to? How purposefully obtuse could a lass be? But then, recalling their conversation last night, something like understanding speared Egan's gut as he blinked. Considering the ardour with which she had defended Craig against the Campbell Guard yesterday, Craig might not be her father, but he was important to her. Perhaps a close relative. This Ian McRae was important too. The name is Egan. I am referring to the fact that you laced those men's food with a sleeping tincture. 
Have you taken leave of your sanity? Egan struggled to keep his voice low, despite the thumping in his chest. She worried her lip, but she remained silent. Indecision fanned out from his midriff, even as something else tightened his nethers. His need to take hold of her shoulders and shake until she saw reason, warred with his desire to draw her in, hook those apricot lips away from her teeth with his own tongue just so he could have a taste. She was utterly and completely unaware of the type of man the Campbell was. The things he was capable of, what he would do to her if she were caught breaking into the dungeon. Egan made a move to turn. I'll just go and inquire with those guards if Ian McRae resides in their dungeon. She darted in front of him. Her whiskey-coloured eyes shot him a glare. Why are you meddling? Every syllable was exaggerated. If Eva or Dagon found out what you two are doing, they would no doubt tell you how irresponsible you are. And if they found out I stood by and let you do it, they would have my hide. Perhaps it was his harsh tone, or the fact that he returned her glare with one of his own. Whatever it was, her expression sobered. Egan's eyes followed the movement of her slender jaw as she swallowed. His unwitting gaze found her lips again. Bloody hell, the devilish things he could do to lips like those. Perhaps it was just that she was so bloody irksome, or the fact that she was standing too close but her floral scent threw a heavy, sluggish haze over his senses. His lungs fought for air, as if he'd stepped into a steamy hut with a thermal bath. He lowered his gaze to avoid leering. Her gown was plain, yet it somehow managed to look regal on her tall, slender figure. The last tended to hold her head high, her chin up and her back straight. An image of her without that gown. Every fair, luminous inch of her exposed with unbound hair hit him like a cudgel to the chest. Egan had to shift his stance for a more comfortable one. He took a deep, cleansing breath and shoved his hands through his hair. What the hell was the matter with him? I apologize. He blinked. Why was she apologizing? He was the one staring at her like a lecherous bastard about to pounce and ravish her senseless. What for? He needed a good dunking in a frigid loch to clear the fog in his head. I had to lace Alban's food with the tincture as well. It was unavoidable. His brows knitted, recalling Alban's slurred words. Why was it unavoidable? Your Alban is too keen. He would have figured out what was happening. We have at most a mere hour before the rest of the keep awakens and someone wanders into the guardhouse. You must leave, I beg you. The plea in her voice was interwoven with a raw apprehension that clawed at Egan's chest. Was this her way of giving in and taking him into her confidence? Or had he forced her hand? Why did the Campbells imprison Ian? Because he dared go against the Campbell. I found out three weeks ago. I'd thought him dead all these years. Skin bunched around her eyes, adding something gut-wrenching to her plea. An intense urge to protect this lass blazed through his body with such vehemence it made Egan unsteady where he stood. She was going to poke the angry wasp's nest. And if the determination he saw in her face was any indication... She was prepared to get herself stung in the process. His sire's words boomed in his head. We lost too many in the old clan wars. Countless fatherless bairns and grieving widows left. We can't allow this to lead to another war. His duty to his sire warred with this strange, burgeoning need to protect this lass, for she would no doubt do this with or without his assistance and the only way to protect her was to assist her. However, in doing so, he also risked poking the angry wasp's nest himself, and a war between the Campbells and the Dunbars goes against his sire. Egan turned away from her and mumbled a few choice expletives. 
He had to resist the urge to stomp his feet like a rebellious boy of ten. The truth was, Egan himself wasn't against war with the Campbells, but every molecule, bone and cell in his body fought against disobeying his sire. Still, assisting the last didn't necessarily mean that war would follow, not if it was done in a well-planned clandestine manner. If it was, the Campbells would be none the wiser. He took a deep breath, prayed he wasn't making a monumental error in judgment, and turned back to face her. There is no way I'm allowing you or Craig to go prancing around the Campbell's dungeon. That's far too dangerous. She drew herself up to her full height, her chin lifted, and she crossed her arms over her chest. Are you going to inform the Campbells? she asked, mutiny etched in her delicate features. I'm coming with you. Bollocks! Had he just offered to break into the Campbell's dungeon and rescue a prisoner? He had taken leave of his bloody senses. Her brows creased in puzzlement. You expect to come with me as I inform the Campbells we're breaking into their dungeon? No, I'm coming with you into the dungeon. We're not informing the Campbells of anything. His whisper was laced with impatience. Egan expected the panic in her gaze to ebb, given that he'd not only agreed to say nothing to the Campbells, but also extended his services in freeing Ian. But instead she shook her head, the whites in her eyes gleaming. No, no, if you'll please just leave. We are quite capable of- This is not a negotiation. His voice was resolute. Egan was as sixes and sevens that she seemed more panicked at his plan to help than at Craig and herself alone breaking into the dungeon. It occurred to him that she didn't trust him which made even less sense since she was the one dissembling. It grated at his nerves. Why had he allowed himself to get caught up in this charade? And what a cold punch in his face that his help was unwelcomed and somehow distasteful. But hang the debt he owed her, the fact that she was Eva's friend, his duty, and the fact that she was lying through her teeth. He just couldn't stand back and let harm come to a woman. Barely discernible footsteps hitting the soft grass sounded behind him. Egan's hand went for the hilt of a dirk as he swung around. He exhaled in a rush of breath. It was Craig. Egan let go of the dirk and swore inwardly. He'd been so taken up with the maddening lass in front of him, he'd failed to keep an eye on their surroundings. What if it had been a Campbell? Craig padded toward them with a questioning look. Is so to miss. I was just pointing out to Brina that if you two have taken leave of your senses enough to break Ian out of the Campbell's dungeon, you will both benefit from my assistance. Craig's eyes bulged. He then scratched his chin. How did you? That's not important. What is important is you understand I'll not allow you to proceed with this absurd plan unless you accept my help because otherwise you'll both get yourselves killed. I don't want that on my conscience. I have enough there already. Egan swallowed the unpleasant taste of guilt as Alex's face hovered on the periphery of his mind. A host of emotions played across Craig's face, from shock to acceptance, then settling on resignation. We accept and appreciate your help. Ian McCrae is innocent. The Campbells cannot be trusted, whatever they claim he did. Egan glanced at Brina, scrutinizingly, at the very moment she chose to rub the back of her neck and look down at her shoes. She'd been caught in a lie, for she'd said the prisoner's name wasn't Ian McCrae, even though he'd gathered as much. I happen to agree with you about the Campbells. That's another reason why I'm prepared to lend a hand, Egan said. Then it seems we're indebted to you yet again, Craig said. There's no debt. Even if by some miracle we manage to free Ian and leave the dungeon undetected and unharmed. Egan was no knight in shining armour, and he'd balk at anyone who thought him such. 
but if not a show of esteem for the fact he'd just agreed to perpetrate a prisoner breakout and risk igniting an already volatile situation with the Campbells, then he at least expected some degree of relief on the faces of Brina and Craig. So why did she still look panicked, and he still look resigned? Chapter 10 Brina stomped into the guardhouse as a riot of emotions surged through her. She was met by two additional sets of snores bombarding the air inside. She took in the fact that Alban and the second guard had nosedived into sleep. Craig and Egan slipped in after her. Brina's chest had squeezed at having to drug Alban, but it had been unavoidable. It was a harmless draught, however, except for its potent sleeping properties. How long will the effects of the sleeping draught last, Egan said. She gave Egan a cutting glance. Irritation flooded her. He meddled where he wasn't welcome. Annoyance heated her insides at the way his perfectly sculpted nose and cheekbones took charge. Who had such ridiculously wide shoulders anyway? Two or three hours if they're undisturbed, she said. Then let's hope they remain undisturbed until we return. I doubt the Campbells are fastidious enough to change guards before then, Egan said. What's the plan? Craig eyed Egan. It's safer if Brina accompanies me into the dungeon, while you remain here on lookout. For a brief moment, Craig looked as if he would object, but he ended up nodding in acquiescence. What if Egan learned of the reason for Ian's imprisonment and her mother's death? Then it was just a matter of time until his friend Laird Russell McIntyre found out. Brina's insides squeezed. She swallowed the bile, threatening to crawl up her gullet. Her life, her future, her livelihood, her reputation as a healer and her chances of finding a decent husband and having a family of her own would be lost. What do I do if a Campbell wanders in? Craig looked at Egan. Since there seems to be one entrance, you will have to come and find us. Why don't we all go down? Brina shook her head, free of its mulling. We need to be sure none of the Campbells have wandered in here, and that we can return with Ian McRae if we find him. Brina regarded Craig. In his raised eyebrows and thinned lips, Brina read worry and doubt. She'd seen those there many times before, like when she'd asked him seven years ago if she could leave Kilmuir to go work for the McIntyres at Duntulm, or when she'd cried for two days straight after Grandmother Sorsha's death. She tried to squelch the worry from her insides, worry that they would be found out by the Campbells, that Egan would come to know of her family's history and of the likelihood that her father was indeed dead. But it refused to be quelled. A few minutes later, cold sweat trickled down Brina's body as she followed Egan down a narrow, musky corridor. She kept her eyes trained on their path, not wanting to trip on the uneven dirt beneath their feet. When Brina stumbled into something akin to a stone wall, she gasped aloud and her head jerked up. The stone wall was Egan's hard-muscled chest. He'd stopped his trek and was considering her. I will not let anything happen to you. His voice was a whisper. Pardon me? She wrinkled her nose at her own gruff voice. Why did his nearness addle her thoughts, her senses and her ability to form words? She shook her head to garner some clarity. I can see the fear in your eyes. I will not let any harm come to you. He then turned and continued his trek. She sprinted to keep up with his long strides. Was she that transparent? She didn't know if it was the fact that her fear showed that he had spotted it or that he chose to mention it, but her back shot up to its full height. She spoke before first considering her own words. I'm not afraid. Why are you lying? This time his voice was laced with irritation. Did he ask that question because he'd seen her fear, 
or because Craig had revealed they were looking for someone named Ian McRae, when she'd denied that very fact just last night. She needed to settle on a story with Craig once and for all, but then again that was neither here nor there. She refused to apologise for lying to protect her family, especially when all she held dear in this world might be taken away. When lies are necessary to safeguard my family and to protect our livelihood, I will gladly spin them. Egan eyeballed her. His darkening gaze reminded her of the skies when a dangerous storm was brewing. Her skin tightened. Is it the Campbell who scares you? He left her to consider that question as he circled around and resumed his trail. The Campbell wasn't the only one she was afraid of. She was afraid that Egan would learn of her family's past, that it would bring her shame. Heaven help her. Was she ashamed of her family's past? Something cold clenched her chest. You accuse me of lying, then ask me another question. Aren't you afraid I'll just lie to you again? Point taken. Brina was having difficulty breathing, and she suspected it wasn't altogether due to the dank air in the passageway, or the anticipation and dread of what they'd find. But without meaning to, she held her breath, awaiting further questions from Egan. While she trailed after Egan, she eyed the length of his back. He was an interesting dichotomy of elegance and ruggedness. He held a position of power as future chief to the Dunbars, and he wielded it with honour. If that wasn't awe-inspiring enough, there was always his imposing physicality. Don't tell me gilded lives of future lairds preclude lies and liars, she said when no other question came. Egan snorted. Is that what you think? I lead a gilded life. Don't you? He shot her a right glance as he continued his trek down the passageway. I can understand why you would think that, but it doesn't mean my life is any less complicated or holds fewer responsibilities or burdens than others. Brina recalled their previous conversation. You alluded to a burdensome conscience earlier. Is that what you refer to now? Egan muffled a chuckle. You have your secrets and I have mine. An iron-framed wooden door came into view at the end of the corridor. It was held closed by a heavy padlock. Egan used the ring of keys he'd purloined from one of the snoring guards, and on the third try, the padlock clunked open. The door's metal frame grated against the ground, and its hinges creaked as Egan pushed it open. He raised his hand. Wait here. He padded ahead, disappearing beyond the door. She quietly stood there, even as coldness coated her spine and her eyes widened. She strained to detect sounds, expecting a Campbell to pounce on Egan, for the sharp clash of a sword's blade against another, for angry shouts to erupt. But instead, Egan returned alone. Follow me. Brina heaved a sigh of relief, not realising she'd held her breath the entire time he'd disappeared behind the menacing door. She obeyed. As the light from the torch Egan carried struggled to fight the darkness, Brina made out a locked wooden hatch in the ground. The tiny round space they'd just entered could have held six or seven people with no room to spare. The stone walls and floor were bare except for the hatch. Egan reached around her and pushed the door closed behind them, then handed her the torch. The heat of its flames hovered over her curled fingers, but it did nothing to warm the coldness in her body. Was her father beyond that hatch? Was a Campbell guard? She considered Egan, at the way his head almost touched the grimy ceiling and the way his shoulders seemed to fill the space. A sliver of calmness settled in her chest. When had her irritation been soothed into gratitude? He did seem to want to help, regardless of his reasons. I don't know many lasses who'll go for a stroll in a dungeon. None, in fact, Egan whispered, as he surveyed the small space around them. Brina raised her chin. 
I assure you it's out of necessity. You have conviction and metal, which I admire. It almost makes up for my momentary lapse in judgment in bringing you here. I'd be here with or without you. I'd guessed as much. His tone held a smile. Brina lowered her gaze. But I'm grateful you're here. The ring of keys jingled as Egan stooped down and tried the first key in the lock that held the hatch shut. Even if you and Craig disapprove of me, or is it my assistance you disapprove of? Her eyes flew up to meet his. We don't disapprove of you. I'm thrilled. Then why do you object to my assistance? Egan attempted to open the lock with another key. She swallowed against the tightness in her throat. It's complicated. Suffice to say, it's a private family matter. He shot her a poignant glance. I've never been accused of being indiscreet. His devilish grin made her forget herself for a second. Her stomach did funny little somersaults as some of the tension eased from her shoulders. He was more dangerous than she'd originally pegged him. She had to be careful not to reveal anything further. I will hold you to your claim of discretion. I promise to reveal to no one yours and Craig's penchant for storming the dungeon, Egan whispered as he tried yet another key. The enormous, rusted lock clanked open. Egan removed the lock and lifted the hatch. An odious smell, something akin to hopelessness and the inevitability of death hit Brina head on. The force of it pushed her back against the stone wall. The cold dankness of the rocks seeped through her clothes and sank into the flesh on her back. A weakening tremor vibrated through her limbs. How could her father survive this for nineteen years? She steadied herself, swallowed, and lumbered forward to look into the opening. It was dark, but she just made out the end of a manila hemp rope dangling below. The rope was tied to a metal ring fastened into the ground where they stood. She shot a curious glance at Egan. I've seen enough dungeons to know what lies below is no place for a woman. But you can't mean to stop me now, after we've come this far. Something akin to panic speared her gut. In truth, she felt faint. Was it the noxious smell or the apprehension of what they'd find? Whatever it was, it weighed like rocks, heavier by the second on her chest, and hit her with a sensation of drifting between reality and the blackest of nightmares. As a healer, she'd cleaned gangrenous legs, soiled bedpans, sores filled with discharge and burnt flesh. So why did the smell of this dungeon affect her? Why was it difficult to breathe in here? Because it wasn't just the smell. Dejectedness stifled the air. It coiled around like a serpent waiting to strike. And the fact that her father had been subjected to this for nineteen years made her want to scream, cry out, and strike back at every single Campbell. I will go and look for Ian. You shall wait here, and on this I will not yield. His voice was low. This is not your decision to make. I suppose as a healer you've seen many unpleasant things. But have you ever seen prisoners after they've been tortured, bloodied, and left for dead? Her eyes widened and she swallowed. I've treated prisoners before, but not in that exact condition. His chin jutted toward the hemp rope. Are you capable of climbing down that rope to the lower level? She sniffed, stifling a groan she hated that he had a point. Maybe two. He seemed to take her silence as agreement of his dictate. How will I know it's Ian McCrae if I encounter him below? She took a deep cleansing breath, exhaled, and pulled on a distant memory of her father. The last time I was with Ian, I was six years old. He towered over me like a great big oak tree. He had dark hair, kind eyes, and a caring face. 
That was nineteen years ago. Brina swallowed back the lump as emotion flooded her. How old is he? Egan scrutinised her. She shifted in discomfiture. About Craig's, my father's age. Her low voice cracked. She was revealing too much and it unsettled her. But they'd reached the proverbial crossroads where she had to trust him, to a point. There was no other choice. Besides, he'd said he was discreet. Could she trust that? Should she trust him? She broke eye contact and looked away. What about scars? Eye color? His eyes always reminded me of warm chestnuts. I don't recall scars. Egan grabbed one of the silver-handled dirks from his belt, flipped it up into the air, caught it by the tip of its shimmering blade and handed it to her. She took it with raised eyebrows. Wait here for me. I won't be long. If a Campbell surprises you, the pointy end of the blade goes into his gut. He winked. He twisted, took hold of the rope and lowered himself into the dark abyss below. As the muffled scrapes and scratches of his palms against the rope sounded, her breathing kicked up a notch at what he would encounter on his descent. When faint footfalls sounded on the earthen floor below and the rope slackened, she held her breath, her hand squeezed around the handle of the torch. Were there guards down there? But receding footsteps were all that echoed up from below. She took a step back and leaned against the stone wall. Her muscles tightened at its coldness. All was silent except for the crackling of the torch in her hand. She closed her eyes, and a memory, like a distant dream, came to her. In it, her parents were together, and the clear azure skies housed a brilliant marigold sun. Their warm smiles eased her insides as they looked down at her. They'd then reached to envelop her in a bear hug while she giggled and squirmed. The softness of her laced daydress almost touched her skin now. The tenderness and love of their embrace and the warmness of the sun a hair's breadth away. That memory now filled her with a wretched emptiness. It curdled her insides. She'd never hug her radiant mother again. Never surround herself in that warm safety. They had taken her. Brina stifled an overpowering urge to howl just so the rawness of it would dull the pain. But amid it all, there was no hope that her father was down there, steps away in this miserable place. Hope that this ever-present hollowness which had plagued her since she was six would ease. The sound of climbing rustled from below. Brina's eyes flew open. The rope had gone taut. She pushed herself away from the stone wall and brandished the dirk in one hand and the flaming torch in the other, even as fear rooted her to the ground. When auburn hair held in a queue started to ascend from the abyss, she relaxed and let out a breath of relief. The rest of Egan's body rose from below, hand over hand on the rope. She stared at him as he climbed through the opening and stood in front of her, his expression impassive. Why was he alone? Chapter 11 Alarm shot through her as she craned her neck to look behind him. She bit down on her lips and shot him a questioning look. He's not in the dungeon, he said. She tilted her head. What does he mean? He's not in the dungeon. Isina stabbed her gut. You have to go and look again. You must have missed him. He's not there. I checked twice. How many prisoners are down there? How can you be sure? Did you search thoroughly? You must go back. Her voice was a strangled rush of words. There are just two prisoners down there. One much younger than Ian and the other is fair-haired. Brina pushed past Egan and grabbed the rope. It couldn't be too difficult. She'd just seen him do it. She'd just have to go and look herself. What are you doing? He asked. I'm going to look for him. 
She tightened her grip on the rope, hesitant as to what would come next. She was about to step into the hole when his hands reached over and covered hers. His hands were much bigger and warmer than hers. They were steady on her tremulous ones. Look at me, he whispered. Rena's eyes welled up. She tried to blink the tears away. A pathetic shriek escaped her lips. She looked away. Rena, look at me. When she did raise her head to face him, she'd lost focus on his expression, for tears blurred her vision. She wanted to pummel him for the concern weaved into his calm voice. Logic must have left her again. Ian McRae is not down there. She wiped away the tears. Her shoulders dropped and coldness washed over her body. Something in her soul sank like a boulder dropping to the bottom of the ocean. She was grateful she hadn't broken her fast yet. Her nausea kicked in. Bile rose and after several attempts she was able to push it down. I'm sorry, he said. Hollowness tightened its relentless grip on her stomach and twisted. She wanted to curl into a ball on the filthy ground and wail until rationality left, until numbness set in and nothing remained, even the cold. She somehow released the rope and managed to put one foot in front of the other as she stumbled after Egan back the way they'd come. Rena was a hair's breadth away from more tears when they returned to the guardhouse. She was in no mood to answer Craig's questions. You didn't find Ian. Egan wordlessly shook his head. The grimness etched in her face must have dissuaded Craig from asking any more questions. He tilted his chin down and frowned. Brina and Craig trudged after Egan in silence toward the keep, after they'd relocked all the doors and gates and returned the pilfered keys to the snoring guard. The sky had turned to a light grey. They stepped through the keep's main door just as two Campbell guards exited and headed in the direction of the guardhouse. If they'd taken a minute longer, they would have been discovered. Will you join me at the Campbell's high table to break your fast? Egan asked, eyeing Brina and Craig after they were back in the great hall. Craig shook his head. It's more fitting that we sit at the low tables, Brina said. Brina and Craig took seats at a trestle table across from two Campbell chamberlains, carrying on a hushed conversation. The woman sitting next to them was a laundress, if the blue washing dye stains on her greying pinafore were any indication. Breakfast, with its hushed conversations and downcast eyes, was a dismal affair. Even the morning sun was missing through the single smudged window. The serving women edged around with stiff shoulders and bleak expressions. The pleasant sense one would expect to waft through the air as breakfast was being served never came. It didn't occur to Brina why everyone looked like they were attending a funeral rather than breakfast, until sounds of the Campbell's sharp nasal voice resonated. Brina veered around toward the high table as the Campbell flung a trencher of food at one of the serving women. The woman's head and shoulders collapsed inward as she shrieked away and burst into tears. From the Campbell's diatribe thrown at the woman, it appeared she'd dared serve him cold food. Just at that moment, Hilda scurried past their table instructing a young maid who proceeded to place several bannock cakes on their table. May I be of help? Brina asked, standing up to face Hilda, ready to lend a hand. Hilda's withering stare made it clear she was impeding the serving process. With serving the food, Brina explained. Only Campbells serve food in the Campbells' great hall, Hilda said, her mouth twisting like she'd tasted something bitter. There was no thawing that frigid iceberg. Brina swallowed and dropped back down on her seat next to Craig. The truth was she didn't fault Hilda for her horrible attitude, if she lived in a dreary keep with bullies and barbarians in charge, with few to no supplies and even less help, she would be in a perpetual foul mood as well. And she wouldn't put it past a prideful personality like Hilda's to view her attempts to help as a statement about Hilda's ineptitude at her job. 
Stop trying to soften her up. That's useless, Craig whispered in her ear. As Brina bit into a piece of tasteless bannock cake, she eyed the wall above the high table where there was the head of a boar, and beneath it, low-relief letters inscribed on a grey stone plaque. Ne oblivis caris. Forget not. Brina stifled a scoff. If she were fortunate enough to leave this pitiable place with her father and Craig, that is one thing she would never do. For the moment they were away from Col, she wanted to forget. Forget it ever existed. Except they'd taken her mother from her. Thus, she'd never be that blessed. Brina's gaze scanned the high table just as a pair of hazel eyes, the colour of smoky quartz, trapped hers. Something had shifted today between the two of them in the dungeon. It was there in the hitching of her breath and the warming of her cheeks as she stared back at Egan. She dragged her gaze away with some effort. Was she coming down with a fever? Brina let her shoulders drop as she sat outside the curtain wall on a flat slate outcropping. The rippling turquoise sea crashed into the sand and ashen rocks of the shore in frothy white waves, dissipating like her hopes. Its pungent, salty scent reminded her of Tullam Bay, just beyond the McIntyre's castle on the Isle of Skye, where she took her evening constitutional. The chill breeze tousled the hems of her skirts and cooled her ankles. The rawness of the pre-dawn events still rattled and twisted her insides. Craig, who sat next to her, exhaled in a disheartening rush of breath. I too am disappointed we didn't find Ian, but from what Egan told me this morning, I don't like to think of your father spending nineteen years in that hellhole, even if one could survive it for so long. Did he tell you he refused to let me go down? The setting sun made its way further down the western sky, taking with it the warmth and marking the coming end of day, as it also marked the coming end of her rescue mission. That was wise on his part. He was trying to shield you from its horrors. Brina harumphed. Does he no longer think Egan a hindrance? Do you think he is dead? She asked, speaking her fear out loud. He was staring down at his hands. I... I do. I'm sorry. I know how much you wanted to have your father back. There was something in Craig's flat monotone that made Brina look at him. You've been my father and Aunt Madeline has been my mother these past nineteen years. And I love you both. But I also don't like to think of my father being down there either. And I'd hoped for an opportunity to get to know him. To find out what happened. Why was he on call? I understand. And your aunt and I love you too. We were never blessed enough to have bairns. But the truth is... We think of you as our own. Brina's vision blurred as tears welled up again and emotion squeezed her throat. She turned in her seat and gave her uncle a bear hug, which he returned with an awkward pat on her bag. What was he like? she asked, releasing Craig. Ian, your mother was the love of Ian's life. He'd have done anything for her. And you the apple of his eye. The warmness of his words seeped into her, but she lowered her head. What if he's not dead? What if they're keeping him elsewhere? Where else can he be? I don't know, but we should scout and snoop around some more. A short while later, as Brina trailed after Craig back in the direction of the curtain walls surrounding Castle Carr, her gaze was drawn toward the Dunbar's camp. She hadn't seen Egan since breakfast. Brina spotted a group of the Dunbar warriors sparring in pairs. The two mountains among them, Keith and Dugray, stood out. The sounds of grunts and punches carried in the air to where they strolled. Echoes of swords clashing against swords rang out, as did the loud thuds of blades slamming into battle axes. Brina's breathing momentarily ceased. Heat ran down her spine when her gaze was drawn to one formidable Dunbar in particular. 
Whether it was Egan's height or his easy grace and assuredness of movement, she wasn't sure, for she was too busy gawking at his golden, sinewy nakedness from the waist up. A restless sort of power surrounded and vibrated in the air around him. A sheen of sweat on his skin in the evening light gave him the glistening aura of a great Norse warrior god. He'd tossed aside his lania and coat while he practised with his men. His hair was pulled back in a queue. Even from a distance her gaze was held captive by the modicum of ruddy hairs on his chest, which trailed a path down his midriff and disappeared in a single line below the waist of his kilt. Her eyes widened, and she swallowed against the rush of moisture flooding her mouth. His upper body was magnificent, all granite-looking, well-defined musculature on his arms, chest and washboard abdomen. The hem of Brina's dress snagged on something, pulling her back as she dawdled. She looked down at the offending thorny gorse bush. Gathering a handful of her skirts, she tugged. A rip sounded. Her uncle stopped and turned around. It's all to miss. My hem's ripped. Brina eyed her skirt. Craig trailed back toward her, narrowing his eyes at the skirt. Just then. A movement ahead made Brina's head jerk up toward the Dunbar camp. One of Egan's men came at Egan with a two-handed sword at least five feet long, while Egan held one of the foot-long silver-handled dirks in his right grip. She gasped aloud as Egan stood in ready position, feet planted wide apart, knees angled and arms out, every bit a fierce highland warrior. The sheer force of Egan's iron will, steely determination and lethal resolve chiselled in his features at that moment, made Brina sorry for the retainer who now charged him. Quite an impressive bunch, Craig said. Uh huh, Brina swallowed, unable to speak. The Dunbar retainer lifted his sword above his head. A roar echoed from his mouth as he swung down hard toward the nape of Egan's neck. At the speed of lightning, Egan spun on his left heel, taking two steps back from his opponent's trajectory and at the same time tangling his dirk's crossguard with the blade of his opponent's sword. A sharp clash of blade against crossguard pierced the air. A few of the other Dunbar retainers stopped their sparring to witness Egan and his opponent. With fluid movements, Egan thrust his dirk outward its crossguard trapping the blade of his opponent's sword with such force the sword was ripped from the other man's hands and sent flying. The sword landed a few feet away with a dull thud. Egan lurched forward and pressed the blade of his dirk against his opponent's throat. I've never seen his equal, Brina said, wide-eyed. She cleared her throat to mask the breathy sound of her voice. What must Craig think of her? Guttural cheers and barks of laughter erupted from the Dunbars. A few of the Dunbar retainers trotted over to Egan, dealing out good-natured slaps on the back. Brina was too far away to catch their exact words. Egan barked out a congenial laugh and in a teasing manner cuffed his opponent's back, who was stunned from the training, but after a few breaths threw his head back and joined the revelry. Come along. Let's head back, Craig said, as he continued in the direction of the keep. As if Egan sensed he had another spectator, he turned, and his dark gaze locked with Brina's. Time stopped. Her world was reduced to just the two of them as her heart rate picked up the pace enough for her to hear it booming in her ears. Was it indecent to stare at a half-naked Highlander? His gaze pierced her straight down the middle, heating her core and scalding every inch of her body. The fire in his eyes pilfered her ability to look away. You're lagging behind, Craig called out to her. Brina blinked. She was ailing from a strange fever. Her entire body burned as if she'd just jumped through a bonfire. She turned away, grabbed her skirts and sprinted to join Craig. Do you fancy the lad? Don't be absurd. Egan's question from their pre-dawn scout through the Campbell's dungeon rang aloud in her head. Why are you lying? Well, it's just as well. 
He's highborn and we're lowborn. I don't have to tell you, that's soil and water. No, he didn't have to tell her that. They plodded through the Campbell's gates. The few Campbells they passed ignored, even avoided them. As they headed toward the keep, guttural coughs rang out ahead. Brina peered into the distance. I spotted her edging earlier, Craig said. She followed her uncle's gaze. A young woman leaned on a tall birch tree toward the back of the keep. One of her hands rested on the trunk for support, while the rest of her was bent over, retching behind the trunk. She raised her head for the briefest of moments as if to catch her breath, but then heaved and bent over again. From her long golden hair and her grey working dress, Rena recognised her as one of the women seated in the great hall during breakfast. If it weren't for her dull complexion with its greyish tinge, she'd be quite pretty. Rena ran through a list of possible causes in her head, starting with dysentery and ending with food poisoning, considering the conditions and food supply of the Campbells. But then something entirely different occurred to her. Can she be with child? Brina asked. From her pale skin, I thought it more along the lines of something she ate. Spoiled food? Craig scratched his chin. Even though the Campbell's cook has no talent for cooking, the bannock cakes were hard as rocks and the black pudding tasted like mud. The food wasn't spoiled. The soft ground beneath their feet silenced their steps as Brina and Craig edged toward the woman. The retching had stopped, and she now leaned back against the grey trunk with her eyes closed. She seemed to be collecting herself. As Brina inched forward, Craig stood back. Brina threw him a questioning glance. I don't want to scare her, he whispered. Brina nodded at him. She surveyed their surroundings. The only Campbells about were the men speaking with the guards. They either hadn't noticed the sick girl, or they'd noticed and didn't care. She snorted with contempt and continued toward the young woman. From her girlish features, she could be five or six years younger than Brina's five and twenty. Brina cleared her throat to alert the girl she wasn't alone. Are you unwell? May I help? The lass's lids fluttered open and she stared at Brina. Confusion dimmed the aquamarine of her eyes. She blinked several times, after which the cloud seemed to disperse. It's happening again. I don't ken what it is, she said, her face twisting in misery. Brina's chest tightened with concern. Could it be something you ate? I don't rightly know. As she spoke, Brina scrutinised the almost imperceptible bluish tint to the lass's lips and the redness of the collarbone area. Brina offered a warm, affable smile. I'm a healer. I can help you. My name is Brina. But the woman's eyes widened in revulsion. Or perhaps she was going to be sick again. A healer! Please, go away! Brina gazed at the girl in surprise, but still took another tentative step forward. Did all the Campbells hate healers? First it was the Campbell himself, then Hilda, and now this poor lass. Leave me be! Stunned by the girl's outburst, Brina's tongue refused to work, but only for a few seconds. But I think you were poisoned. Please, I can help you. The lass wobbled one step back away from Brina, her eyes bulging as she shook her head in disbelief. Poison? That can't be. She swerved and staggered toward the curtain wall. Brina stared after her. Please, come back, wait, let me help you. But the lass kept stumbling toward a gap in the curtain wall, and then she was gone. Brina's mouth slackened with incredulity. Who would want to poison such a helpless-looking lass? Chapter 12 Egan considered a succulent piece of mountain hair before popping it in his mouth. The spiced smell of the meat and the scent of burning oak from the camp's fire mingled with the earthy evening air as purplish-pink clouds drifted across the sky. 
His senses were assailed by his men's loud chatter. Half his men belly ached about giving up the last harvest, Samhain, to be here. The other half prayed they'd get back at the Campbells for what they'd done to Callum and Brody. Many in his clan wanted justice and revenge for the two families now left without fathers, but Egan had to honour his father's request. His words rang aloud in his head. We lost too many in the old clan wars, countless fatherless bairns and grieving widows left. We can't allow this to lead to another war. His father's orders were sacrosanct, and he intended to carry them out despite the gnawing in his gut that said the Campbells should pay. Mayhap he would always be a bairn of ten, doing whatever he had to to get his father's approval. Dougray's resonant voice encroached on his mulling, and he shifted to eye him. He was describing to the men his latest partner in bed sport, who had a penchant for screaming like a banshee. I always forget to put my hands over my ears when she comes. Then her yowls puncture my eardrums and I remember. Half his men barked out in laughter. Egan had decided to have his eventide meal with his men at the Dunbar camp. Anything to dodge eating food prepared by the Campbell's cook. Why was it that the entire thirty-odd Campbells in the Great Hall earlier that day hung their heads as if they'd rather be anywhere but there? Alistair Campbell. The few words they'd exchanged during the morning meal had cemented the Campbell as a hypocritical, callous despot in Egan's mind. The Campbell had introduced his half-brother William, and then had proceeded to insult the man. My father disgraced our family by taking up with the local whore from Aranagur. William's the result, Alistair had said. It shouldn't have surprised Egan that the Campbell had dished out insults to his own half-brother with such imperiousness and nonchalance. Even though William had remained quiet and stoic, Egan hadn't missed the way his nostrils flared or the way his hands curled around his goblet at the Campbell's words. A serving woman had tripped and nearly fallen off the dais as she poured ale in their goblets, the speed and agility with which William reacted, grabbing the woman by the arm and saving her from a fall, had stunned Egan. Not only was the man quick on his feet, but he was gallant as well. Not traits Egan had ever expected to see in a Campbell. I'm a generous person, willing to give a man a chance in spite of his black origin, the Campbell had carried on. Impatience had needled Egan even as disgust made him shake his head. From the way Alistair treated his clan, he was anything but generous. The man had gone on to pontificate as he took a mouthful of food and wiped his mouth on his sleeve. I am so generous that I've brought William here to better his future by serving as my head of retainers. My father had him trained as a warrior from a young age. He can now put that training to good use. Egan had later inquired of William, if he'd been on Dunbar territory two weeks ago, and if he recalled what had happened between the Campbells and the Dunbars. I wasn't with those Campbells. I am sorry you lost two of your men, William had said. A gallant and sympathetic Campbell. More than likely, it had started to snow in Hades. Rory's loud voice jarred Egan from his musings. The scullery maid I tucked a few weeks ago left nail marks all over my bike. While she screamed in pleasure, I screamed in pain. Rory bellowed with laughter. Egan curled his lips as Rory elaborated on the particulars of the story. He refrained from scoffing. Where did his men find these women? Egan leaned back on the hard, cold outcropping where he sat as his mind flashed to Brina. Something had squeezed relentlessly in his chest at the devastation on her face when he told her Ian hadn't been in the dungeon. He'd made the right decision in asking her to wait on the upper level. Egan wasn't squeamish, but if it wasn't the rank smell that sat in the air, then it was the two crumpled dead bodies that had made his stomach churn. He'd told her only of the two prisoners who were alive, the dead men who could have been Jacobites, were too young to be Ian McRae anyway. The question remained, however. If Ian McRae wasn't in the dungeon, 
Was there a chance the Campbells had him locked up elsewhere? Why the hell did the paralysing indignation of the whole pre-dawn episode unsettle him so? Because he had to help her, even though it went against all he'd come here prepared to do, to prevent a war. The cost had been too great the last time he'd ignored someone. Alex's death had been gnawing at his insides for the past fifteen years. His little brother's death had wrecked him, and try as he might, he recalled the good times with less and less clarity. They'd climbed trees together and swam in the sea together. He'd taught Alex to fish in the loch and to skin a mountain hare after their first hunt. But what ended up sticking out in his memory with unblemished recollection was the day he'd ridden home after receiving the missive at Inwar Garach, where he'd been fostering. The day he'd seen Alex's lifeless little body. The air thinned around him. Even now the sharp pain of it speared his gut despite the intervening years. He ought to have given Alex more of his time and not let his duty get in the way. But he'd been too busy with his own bloody self-importance. Egan flexed his fingers against the sting of guilt, cracking a few of his knuckles in the process. He'd do whatever he could to help Brina and Craig. His conscience couldn't take the extra load. He heard footfalls and turned. Dogre approached. How will we know if the Campbells return during the night from hunting? Besides the fact that our current position here gives us a bird's eye view of who enters and leaves the Campbells keep, the Campbell said he'd inform me, Egan answered. It won't surprise me if that slips his mind, Dugray said, his voice laced with derision. Egan wrapped up his meal, then left camp with Dugray in the direction of the Campbell's keep. At the keep, they took the stairs two and three steps at a time. On the fourth level, they headed to Egan's bedchamber. Dugray was to stand guard tonight outside Egan's door, but even without Dugray, Egan wasn't concerned at the possibility that he'd encounter any one of the Campbells with ill intentions at night. With years of training under the MacDonald's tutelage, a feared and revered warlord, he was an adept warrior himself. His men, however, would never allow him to be unguarded in the keep of a hostile clan. When they stepped into his bedchamber, Alban was waiting with an eager smile plastered on his face, bouncing from foot to foot like a bairn dying to share news. Is all to miss, Egan said. It seemed the reconnaissance mission he'd given Alban, after the lad had awoken none the wiser to what had caused him to fall asleep in the first place, had been successful. Alban peered at the door as if to confirm that only Egan and Dugray were about. He scampered up to them with wide eyes. Dugray closed the door. Both Dugre and Egan regarded Alban with questioning looks. Alban did love the dramatics. If he failed as a warrior, he'd make a splendid thespian. He leaned toward Egan's ear, placed his palms halfway across his mouth, and spoke just above a whisper. I overheard two Campbells in the guardhouse. They are holding more prisoners in the gabled garret of the cylindrical flanking tower. Strange place for prisoners. Egan scratched his chin, even as a spark of hope crept into his belly. These prisoners have each incurred the personal wrath of the Campbell, and he takes pleasure in torturing them himself, Alban said. Dugray bared his teeth. The man's demented. Egan's mind raced with the ramifications of Alban's news. If Ian McRae was in the flanking tower, what in Hades could he have done to incur the personal wrath of the Campbell himself? His sire's orders precluded him from striking back at the Campbell for the deaths of Callum and Brody. But who'd know if he struck back at the Campbells in a surreptitious manner for their imprisonment of Ian McRae? Of one thing he was certain. Anything that would give the Campbell grief would fill him with satisfaction, as it would his men. Is this regarding the healer's search of the guardhouse? Dugray said. Egan cocked an eyebrow at Dugray. 
How had Dougray found out that Brina and Craig had interest in the guardhouse? Dougray cleared his throat and answered the unspoken question. Keith might have mentioned that the healer and her father were interested in the dungeon. There was a reason Dougray was Egan's second in command. In addition to possessing the strength of ten men, he was damn astute. If you are planning to cause trouble for the Campbells, it would be my absolute pleasure to assist you, Dougray said, a smirk lighting up his face. Egan snorted. You and every other Dunbar retainer I'd venture to guess. Egan was surprised that a strange protective streak for Brina chose that moment to hit him in the midriff. Brina had asked for discretion, so he had every intention of saying as little as necessary to his men. Then he recalled her unapologetic attitude regarding her lies. Had there ever lived a man capable of deciphering the bewildering ways of women? He eyeballed Alban. Did you learn anything else? No, sir, not about the prisoners. However, regarding your other request, one of the Campbell guards said he was looking forward to joining the hunt with the Redcoats, and he mentioned the MacDonnell lands in the Western Highlands, Alban said. This is confirmation these bastards are working for the Sassanachs, Dougray growled. Bollocks! Egan swore, curling his lips. Keep your bloody voice down. Do you forget where we are? His voice was a barely contained whisper as he shot Dougray a sharp look. Egan had used that jibe himself before, referring to the British as Sassanachs, but that wasn't what chafed his nerves. Dougray, it appeared, had forgotten that his outburst could possibly be overheard by the Campbells, alerting them to Egan's interest in their prisoners. Apologies, sir. Dougray's shoulders sagged in a contrite manner. Egan fisted his fingers against the dark emotions the redcoats always elicited from him. He had to warn the MacDonalds. I want you to go to Gregor at camp. Have him send two of our men post haste to Dagon and Angus MacDonnell at Castle in Wargara with the news. Leith and Camden are our quickest and most skilled riders, Egan said. Dougray headed for the chamber's door, but paused. When I leave, you'll be without a guard, sir. You're my right hand, Dougray, not my nursemaid. Yes, sir. The truth was, Dougray was too impetuous, bordering on reckless to have around for any type of covert mission. Also, have Gregor send someone to relieve Keith from guard duty, and have Keith join me. A plan formed in Egan's head as his mouth curved up in anticipation. Dougray gave a curt nod and departed to the chamber. Alban gave Egan a questioning glance. Can I arrange a bath and dinner for you this evening, sir? I ate at camp, and there's no time for a bath. We have more important things to do tonight. Alban quirked an eyebrow. We do, sir. Egan strode over to the single window in his bedchamber. He grabbed the window sill straightened his arms and leaned out, studying the view. Greyness had blanketed the world outside. There was something about dusk, when it was neither day nor night as yet, that caused uncertainty to linger in the air as one awaited the coming blackness of night. His gaze traversed the courtyard and came to rest on the entrance to the flanking tower. That wasn't covert enough. Far too risky. Egan's eyes then roved the distance between his window and the flanking tower, pausing with particular interest at the connecting point between the keep and the gabled garret. He grinned. Difficult, but not impossible. He was about to pivot away from the window when he spotted two Campbell guards patrolling the perimeter. He'd have to deal with those blighters. A wide smirk broke across Egan's face. For the first time since arriving on this godforsaken isle, things were looking up. Looks like our heroes have teamed up. 
Thank goodness, because I was worried for a second that Egan would blow Brina's cover. Luckily, his distrust of Laird is enough that he's willing to help her find Ian McRae. What will Egan do when he finds out Ian is Brina's father? And could he be one of the prisoners in the flanking tower? Tune into the next episode as Egan encounters a big, hulking obstacle. So don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped. If you don't want to miss a beat, listen to Bewitching a Highlander now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. You can find Roma Corden on social media at Roma Corden. And make sure you follow us at Camcat Books. Tune in to hear all our audiobooks as we release them right here on Camcat Unwrapped as serialized podcasts. The first two episodes of every book can always be found here, but subsequent episodes will be available for free listening only for a short time after their release. After that, they'll be gone. But don't worry, the audiobooks are available for purchase on Audible and other major retailers. CamCat Unwrapped also offers other CamCat books as podcasts. Check out our background episodes where we unwrap exclusive content relating to our books, including interviews with the authors, editors, and other industry professionals. Before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you. Tune in again to CamCat Unwrapped, because CamCat Unwrapped is where book lovers meet.